Right. Um, good, good afternoon, stroke evening to everybody here. Um, my name's Professor Alex Lamont. I'm a, a professor of music psychology here at Keele, and I'm going to introduce tonight's Grand Challenges lecture. Um, so I'm going to introduce our speaker in just a moment, but a little, before I'm going to say just a little bit about... Um, what's going on, and for those of you who are less familiar with the context of these lectures. Um, briefly, for those of you who are new to this, um, this is hosted by the Institute for Liberal Arts and Sciences at Keel, um, ILAS, whose uh, relatively new director, uh, Professor Tim Lustig, is with us tonight. So for those of you in the room, you can see Tim waving. Um, for those of you online, you can look him up later. Um, so ILAS promotes interdisciplinary education and research at Kiel and beyond. Um, and it has a brilliant website where there's lots of information about what sorts of activities it does, including organizing these lectures. And there's a big um, repository of past lectures. If you want to revisit lectures you were at, or if you missed something exciting, um, you can go back and have a look at it there. Um, so you can see videos of previous of the lectures. Um, so I want to just introduce uh, Michelle then to us, uh, to us, to you today. And um, we've got people here um, in person. There's a large number of people in the room, and we've also got people joining us online. I'll say a bit more about that um, uh, in a moment. Uh, I've been given a brief, and I think it probably would have been better if I'd just spoken off the top of my head because I know what I want to say, but I've now got to stick to my brief. So um, it is our great pleasure to introduce um, and to invite Dr. Michelle Phillips to de deliver this evening's lecture. So um, I know Michelle from a long way back. Um, we share a former PhD supervisor. Um, we were both at Cambridge, but not at the same time. Um, but we've known each other for a long time through the music psychology research community. Um, Michelle is now senior lecturer and deputy head of undergraduate programs at the Royal Northern College of Music up the road in Manchester. And her research interests are diverse, so she includes um, topics like music and time, the perception of contemporary music, and audience response to live and recorded music, which is the theme of today's talk. Um, she's also worked in entrepreneurship and also done some really fascinating work on music and Parkinson's. And I'm sure she will be happy to talk to people who are here present afterwards about some of those other topics. Um, she is also leading a really interesting new project with Manchester Camerata looking at the physiological, behavioural and neurological response to live and recorded music, which is funded by the Centre for Cultural Value at the University of Leeds. And I'm sure that's part of what's going to focus uh, today's talk. So Michelle will be happy to take questions at the end of the lecture. Um, for those of you who are online, hello, uh, very well, warm welcome to you. Um, you can engage with the questions at the end through the Q&A portal uh, on the right-hand side of your screen. I'm saying this without looking at a screen, so I have every confidence that that's going to work. Um, and it's really nice to see people joining us online, and we've got people from the amateur singing world who are uh, with us today uh, in the UK and abroad, and we've also got Bill Proctor, who was a former president of the Students' Union at Kiel from 1965 to 66. So it's wonderful that these events create such a, a great way of bringing together students, current students, current staff, and alumni, and friends of the university. So every Everyone is very welcome. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Michelle. Thanks, Alex. And it's lovely to be here. Thank you so much for the invite. It's really nice to be amongst friends, colleagues, um, and to be in this fantastic room. And for those of you who are joining us online, you're missing a bit of a treat, because this is an amazing venue with an amazing ceiling, so you'll have to Google that. So I would like to invite you to think back to your favorite musical memories. And those might be times when you've listened to recorded music, when you've attended an event or a festival, when you've heard music as part of a celebration or as part of a funeral, maybe, or uh, when you've listened to music in your car. Think about the moment and why it was special for you. What was the music that was played? Um, who was playing it, singing it? And what was the occasion? Who were you with? And then I'd ask you to think about what it was for you that makes that moment memorable and which of those factors might be playing into that memory. I've got many treasured musical memories. I was lucky enough to see the Spice Girls before they were big. Uh, I don't admit that to many people. 
Um, and I've got many memories that uh, play very formative parts in my life. Lots of memories of moments when I was a teenager listening to music. Um, I find it difficult to listen to Abide With Me because that was a very big part of a funeral from someone I was close to. Some of my favourite memories are listening to Richard Strauss's Salome in Berlin and having the chance to see Michelle Legrand in a jazz club in Washington. Um, and actually, you've got a lot of fantastic work on musical memory going on here with Professor Alex Lamont's work. So I'm not going to talk about memory, but there's some fantastic work in that area. Um, so I feel very lucky to have, have had music in my life and to have the, had these vivid and meaningful memories. But what's clear to me from moments like this is that it's not always the music that makes these moments special and memorable. And it's not always the performers either. There are other factors that play into why a musical experience is special for us. And what may have marked a musical milestone might be the sense of occasion, the people we were with, the actual event that was taking place, or the stage of our lives that we were at. So this is the first piece of the puzzle for me in thinking about how and why we engage with live music as humans, and what makes this experience special, why we have these important musical experiences in our lives that become very formative and very memorable. And the second factor that's become a key part of my research that I'll touch on today is what we've been left with following the COVID-19 pandemic, because that was a time that gave us, a, in a way, a unique opportunity to do research amongst all the horrors of the other things that it gave us because we were deprived of the live music experience. And it's been fascinating to do research in that time and just afterwards to see what impact that's had and what we've missed about live music. And many organisations we saw experimented with live streaming their performances and tried to keep audiences engaged like that. And what do we do now? Do we return to in-person performances? Do we continue to stream performances? Should we be developing sophisticated hybrid technologies in our concert venues and concert halls? For example, this is a venue in London. I don't know if you know, this is the Coco venue, a very, very famous venue that suffered significant fire damage just before COVID. And they made the decision during the pandemic to build into the rebuild very um, technologically advanced streaming capability. So that venue is now a venue where you can stream every performance. And you can see here, Adam Lambert launched his new album there recently. So should venues be making those decisions? So for the next 20-ish minutes, um, I'll discuss some research that I've done and that others have done to address this question of what makes a live music experience special? And along the way, I'll bring in these two important factors. What is it about that occasion, that event, that made that special for us? And also, what decisions might venues, performers, bands, organisations be making about whether to offer events in live format or to also live stream them post-COVID-19? Humans have been listening to music for thousands of years. You can see the bone flute on the right here. And music is an important part of every culture around the world. Music's universal. Whether people listen to music via a streaming platform or on the radio, or they use music for religious celebration, or as a way of communicating between hunting tribes, all humans have some form of music in their lives. And theories as to why this is, these are some of my favourite musicians, favourite moments, theories as to why this is are varied. But one of the theories, which has received a lot of attention and which I really like, is the idea that music is a form of communication. And it has many meaningful and necessary attributes as a form of communication. And for those of you, many of you who are here, I'm sure some of this might sound familiar. You know, there's a reason why we have amateur bands, amateur choirs. There's a reason why music is an essential part of when we are happy, when we're sad. Um, we use music to form connections with other humans and to communicate and to cohese social groups. Music helps us to be with one another and to develop those relationships and those communities. Um, so we, music is a shared experience. When we dance together, when we clap together, there's a reason why teenagers use dancing in nightclubs to form their identities and to form those initial relationships when they first start exploring those things. So we use music to help us communicate and thereby form social bonds. So this theory that humans have music because it helps them to communicate and form and develop relationships and communities is becoming quite key to my research. And as I show you some of the experiments that myself and others have done, um, I'll show you how I think this theory comes in nicely with the results that I have. 
So I'm going to talk about um, two main pieces of research that I've been doing, and I'll finish by discussing some of the future work I'm planning, and I'll end with a lovely video that, that is hot off the press a couple of weeks ago with something experimental that I'm trying out. I don't know whether it's going to work or not yet, so I'm looking forward to your feedback. Um, so there's lots of work being done on the live music experience. There's some really great research. There is an acceptance that there is a quality of liveness. There's something about the live experience that is different to something that is not in person. And that's been around you know, before, before the COVID-19 pandemic. But there's also some really nice work being done now around this idea of the concept of pandemic media, that there is a different form of um, sharing an event with people that particularly came about during the pandemic. But I'll just mention these three pieces of research that I really like and that my own work has built on. So some really nice research being done on connectedness, this idea that music might help us to feel connected um, and that there are ways of facilitating connectedness in a live stream. You know, simple things like Facebook Live are very good at doing this, allowing people to comment and to add emojis to a live performance to feel connectedness with other audience members. There's some great research being done um, by Mimi O'Neill and others in York on this idea that the social experience in the concert hall is important and that part of our motivation to go and to share in a live performance is as a social occasion, either with the people we go along with or the people sitting adjacent. And there's some really nice research being done between Canada and uh, Oslo on this idea that live music has some quality that might be more engaging than recorded music. So I'll show you some work that I've done that's built on those studies. There are various ways of testing someone's experience to live music compared to live streamed or recorded music. Um, and uh, I'm just going to briefly outline what they are before I then show you some of the things I've done. And actually, it's a really nice time to be doing research in this area because technology is becoming cheaper and easier to use. So firstly, you can simply ask people. You can ask people, you know, what did you like best, the live streamed version of that thing you saw or the, or the in-person version? So there's a lot of work being done with surveys and, surveys and questionnaires and interviews, which is you know, fantastic research. And the first study I'll show you uses that method. Um, secondly, you can look at their bodily responses. So you can look at things like their eye movements, their heart rate, their breathing. The sense to the extent to which they feel calm or stressed or excited, you can measure their arousal. Um, you can measure their bodies as well. So you can actually measure how they move. There's some of the great work that's been done has looked at um, how people bob their head or how they move and do they move more in a live experience versus um, a live streamed experience. And thirdly, you can look at their neurological responses. So my um, longtime and much-loved collaborator, Joanna, here is sporting an EEG cap, an electroencephalography cap, which measures neurological response to music. And I'll, I'll show you a study, um, that study, where we use that method. So some studies of live experiences use one of these. Some use multiple methods at one time. And I'm going to start with a survey that I did over the COVID-19 pandemic with some collaborators and then move on to a study that uses both biological and neurological measurements. Um, so it uses, it gathers all three of those kinds of data. And I think what's fantastic is nowadays there are many more studies that, take, that use lots of data at the same time and get a real insight into the richness of just what makes live music special for us. So the first study was a large survey that I conducted with a lovely team of collaborators to ask exactly that question of what, makes a, what, what motivated people pre-pandemic to go to a live event versus a live streamed event. And of course, that wasn't a very common thing pre-COVID, a live streamed event, but there were people who were already engaging with that. So it was a survey that asked what are listeners' motivations to attend live and online music and to look at whether there was any evidence of behavior change. So post-COVID-19, when we know how to access live streamed music, and many venues still make their music available live stream, the Wigmore Hall are doing a great job of this. Um, do people now prefer live stream music? Is there any evidence of that? And I'll, there's a bit of a spoiler, the evidence is no, there isn't. Live music is something special, and we've all flocked back to live music. So this was an online survey that was sent out to people only in the UK and defined the lockdown period as the end of March 2020 to 21. Sorry to bring that back to everyone's memories. We're all very happy to forget a lot of that, I'm sure. Um, so it was a, a survey that asked people questions around this, and I'm just going to show you four slides with some of those results. 
The first one that I found really interesting is this is a slide that shows people's motivations to attend live versus live stream performance. And these are the most common responses. So on the left-hand side of this table, you can see the most common reasons people said that they, they were motivated to attend live performance pre-pandemic were having fun and having a good night out and sharing an experience. So I've underlined the factors here that are different. The other two are the same in each column. And on the right, you can see the live streamed responses, people's motivations to attend live stream performances. And what you can see there is the top one is the quality of the band and the performer, and the second one is the sense of occasion, same as the live music, but the, thing, the ones that are different, so, are different, filling my free time and the sound quality in my home environment. So the takeaway from this is that when I asked people about their motivations to attend live performances pre-COVID, they didn't say, I love the music, I love the band. They said, having fun and sharing an experience. So again, comes back to the idea that a live music experience is about much more than the music, it's about being with one another. Second piece of data, um, this, is the, this is some results from a thematic analysis about what people said in terms of what they saw as the advantages and disadvantages of this new pandemic media live streaming their performance. So the advantages to live stream include things, things like convenience, the logistics, you don't have to travel, the accessibility. So for example, people who are living with disabilities might find it much more easy to access live stream performance. People who have social phobias, um, I won't read the whole list, but what's interesting about the advantages is you can see a couple of factors there that relates to, to people who perhaps weren't being catered for before we were able to live stream events. People who had concerns around climate change, that's why environment's in there, who don't want to travel, said actually this is great because I don't feel I have to get in my car. And people who had, who were living with conditions that meant they couldn't leave the house or perhaps had caring responsibilities. And what you can see in the disadvantages, you'll see these themes coming back again. The disadvantages of a live stream performance, you don't get the sensory experience, the social interaction, we're seeing that again. Um, it's not the same emotionally, you don't get the quality. And the logistics, people mentioned they like going out, having a drink, having a meal, being in a nice venue. So the next uh, bit of data I'll show you is the most boring pie chart ever, but I think it's impactful in what it shows us. So this is a pie chart that shows the results of the data when you ask people, what do you find most enjoyable? And the blue segment is a live performance and the red is a live streamed performance. So I, I think that's probably not surprising to us. We've probably got lots of people here who love to go to live music, but it's really interesting as one of the questions, the research questions behind the survey was behavior change. You know, mind people say, actually, online performance is fantastic. I can wear my pajamas and sit on my sofa. So there's not a lot of evidence from that part of the data that there, are, that there is behavior change. Um, I'm gonna show you a little bit more data. This is a graph. You don't need to read all of this, and some of it's small. But what this shows you is people's um, main reasons that they find live, which is the blue bars, and live streamed or online performance more enjoyable. And what this shows you is that for the people who find live performance more enjoyable, there were more of them, that's why the bars are bigger, um, those first two points are around interaction, the opportunity to interact with other audience members and the opportunity to interact with the performers. So again, the main reasons people who preferred live performance said that they found it most enjoyable were not the music, they were the interaction with other people in the space. And the main motivations for people who listen preferred music online again, are around logistics, convenience. They're also not around the band or the performer. So this is giving us a really nice picture of what it is about live music that makes it special and that it's not all about the music. Um, and two more slides on these data. This again is a thematic analysis of what people thought liveness was. And these are the kinds of things people mentioned. So liveness is about interaction. Liveness is about being in the atmosphere, being immersed, being there in real life, sensory experiences and a shared experience. And I've added some of the quotes that people gave to this te open text box in there. So again, what people see liveness as being is not just about seeing the performers and feeling their vibrations. It's, it's, it's a really complicated fabric of other things as well. And this is the final slide on these data. This is um, just to show 
how we look to that question of whether there's any evidence of behavior change. So we asked people in this survey, can you think about a live event you attended pre-COVID-19? And can you think about what made that event special for you? And if you could have accessed this online instead, would you have attended online instead? And what you can see is that most people said they were highly unlikely. But you can also see on that first graph on the right-hand side, there were some people who said, Do you know what, if I'd had the opportunity, I would have attended online instead. So the takeaway from that is there's a market for live streamed performance. And it's probably for some of those reasons we saw three slides ago. People who, for, for, for various reasons, prefer or need to be at home. Um, and then the final graph there, after COVID-19, how likely is it you'll stream more performances online and go to fewer live in-person events? And most people, again, said highly unlikely. Again, there's a market for live stream performance. OK, so I'm going to show you the second big study, which is the one that Alex mentioned briefly. And this is a study to look at people's bodily and neurological responses to live versus live streamed music. So this is using those two other methods. So the, on the right is an electroencephalography cap, that's an EEG cap, and it measures the parts of the brain and the frequencies within the brain waves that are responding at any one time, um, regardless of what you're doing. It's a really nice way of recording people's responses to music because it's very fast. So you can get a really detailed picture of, of how the brain's responding to music. And at the bottom there, that's an Empatica E4 wristband. It looks like a Fitbit. And it goes very easily around someone's wrist. And it can measure various things, including it can infer heart rate. And it can measure the sense of arousal, so the extent to which you might feel stressed or excited versus calm. So it's a really nice bit of technology that gives really sophisticated data. And I'll show you some of the outputs from both of those. So this was a, a, a large-scale study with lots of lovely collaborators, and this was a study run in collaboration with Manchester Camerata and their musicians, and funded by the Centre for Cultural Value, so thank you to them. And it was a study where we invited uh, people from the mailing list of the Manchester Camerata to come into the lab, the EEG lab at the University of Manchester, and to listen to three things, which are listed at the bottom there. So they listened to a live performance by a Manchester Camerata string quartet. And this was a five-minute performance. Um, half of it was an extract from a Beethoven string quartet, and half was Haydn. And the choice of repertoire was based on the fact that this was repertoire that the string quartet were already preparing. Uh, they also listened to a video of that exact performance that we took that morning, which was intended to be our live streamed version. And then finally, they listened to a high quality version of that performance that had been pre-recorded by Manchester Camerata. So it's like a music video, with lots of multiple camera angles and really nicely edited and produced. And they listened to those in different orders, you know, so not everybody listened to the live version first. So what we were looking for is, is there a difference in people's brain and bodily response when they listen to those three different things? So again, I'll show you some of the data. We are still analyzing this data, so this is hot off the press. Um, so what you can see is, uh, again, this graph is, is sort of a bit of a no-brainer, but it's a useful graph. What you can see on this one is we asked people, this is survey data, we asked people for each of those three things, live, live streamed, which was our recorded one, and high quality music video. So for each of those three things, and they are blue, red, and yellow on this graph respectively, for each of those three things, how do you rate the overall listening experience from one, not very good, to seven, very good? How do you rate the enjoyment of the performance? How do you rate the um, similarity to a live concert? How do you rate the, the extent to which you felt it was a shared experience with the audience? And so on. So what you can basically see from this, the red stars above the bars indicate that when you run the statistics on this, those blue bars were statistically significantly different from the other two. So what you can see is that for the live music condition, people rated all of these as higher, except for familiarity, which you'd sort of expect. The music was the same, so that you wouldn't expect a different rating of familiarity. So again, this links in what the other data have already showed us. You might expect this. So when you ask people in a survey, you know, how immersed did you feel? For the live experience, they said, oh yeah, much more immersed. The slightly more, the, the kind of newer, and for me, I think slightly more exciting data, because this isn't something that's being done around the world really yet, and we're hoping to really build on this with the next experiments. This is the neurological data. So what you can see from this top left graph is the red line there is the extent, is, is the evidence that we have of the live data and the extent to which people listening in the live condition were somehow more engaged. 
So there's various interpretations of these data. That graph on the top left shows, uh, so the, the two other lines are quite similar, the blue and the purple line, which you can't, you can't even really see the distinction between them. The red is the live. And it shows us that there's something more going on. In some way, people were paying more attention or they were more focused or they were more immersed. So that, again, there's a difference with the live condition. The graph on the right, on the top right, shows us that there's, a, there's some differences there between the different types of brainwaves that were responding in the different conditions. And that's something that we're looking into more at the moment. And when you know the speed of different brainwaves that are responding to different things, you can infer the extent to which people are engaged or the extent to which they are listening to things in certain ways. And those graphs on the bottom split those out, the delta, alpha, theta, beta, and gamma. Different speeds of brain waves and the different ways in which people were responding. Now, what we can tell from this data is slightly limited because um, what we know is that the live condition seems to show us something different, but we need more research on what that different thing is. You know, was it the fact that people just felt there was another human in the room? Or was it that they felt that the vibrations off the walls were different to the speakers? We can't separate out what was different, but in some way the live music was different when you look at neurological responses. And finally, these are people's um, responses from the empatica wristband. So what you can see here is the top is the galvanic skin response. You can see a measure of heart rate on the second line, the red line. The purple is an accelerometer. Um, so what you can see here is just one participant. Um, and what we can see from those data is, again, there are differences, but we don't know what they are. And actually, all our participants look different from that physiological data. So there's less we can tell from that. But what we know is that the method is working. So there's more research to be done. So I'm going to draw those two projects together. So what we know... What we know is that a live music experience is complex. Um, and... The work that we've done and that I've done with colleagues and others have done shows us that there are many factors that play into a live music experience and it's not just about the music and the performer. So people's motivations for attending live music might be less about the music itself in some circumstances and more about the non-musical aspects, the sense of occasion, the chance to interact, the feeling of being immersed or physically present. So I've summarised here some of the factors that other research and those two studies I've presented have suggested impact on a live music experience. But for me, my next set of research will stand back from this and think, okay, well, that's really interesting and really useful, but what matters more? Now, this is gonna be a difficult task to think about because what matters more will be different for different people at different times. But I've started to try and think about how I might model this. And this is a very initial attempt. And this is, I haven't shared this with anybody, so I love your ideas. And I've tried to think about this in terms of a model a bit like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You know, what are the basics of what you need in a live music experience at the bottom? Well, you need music and you need a performer or performers. Um, what else do you, do you need ideally? Well, you need a venue and some, and some audio and you need some logistics. You need some chairs or stage. Um, but then what, is, what, what, what do you need to make that experience really rich and really fruitful? Well, you need, you need the idea of it being an event, to be there in person, some sort of occasion. Even if that's, you know, wearing your nice clothes um, and, and making a real event of it, having a nice meal. But what then to make it a really meaningful experience? And this is as you go higher up the pyramid. Um, you need to feel engaged, you need to feel immersed, and you need to feel um, a sense of emotional presence. And there's some fantastic work being done with virtual reality. You know, can we wear virtual reality headsets and feel like we're in the Wigmore Hall with other people or feel like we're in the Manchester Arena? And actually, what that research is suggesting is partly yes, partly no, because some of the things at the top of this pyramid are very difficult to replicate with a headset on. You know, can you really, represent, can you really replicate that sense of engagement or immersion? We need this to be a social or a shared experience. It's coming through really strongly from the data. We need to feel connected to other humans. And as I mentioned at the beginning, this ties in with so many theories that we have about why humans have music, because it helps us to be human, helps us to form bonds with each other. It helps us to share an experience that is a really meaningful one and a really important one. It brings communities together, families, teenagers. 
Um, and finally, interaction at the top there that doesn't quite fit in that small triangle. Um, uh, for a really meaningful, rich experience and something that we value very highly in live music, from the data we've got so far, you know, there's more research to be done. We want our live music experiences to be interactive, whether that's with other audience members or whether it's with the performers on stage. And again, these are very difficult things to replicate in a live streamed experience. And I think what we need to bear in mind from this is that if we are going to embrace the idea of an event being live streamed, broadcast online, either in real time or recorded, if we are going to embrace that, and there's an argument that we should embrace that, because we now know that there are people who are being catered for, who weren't being catered for before. People who with social phobias, caring responsibilities, concerns around climate change. There's a market for live stream performance. But perhaps what we shouldn't be trying to do is think, how do we take that live thing and make it work live streamed? Maybe we should be seeing live streamed performance as a totally different media. And I think that's a question that's really interesting to ask, and there are some other venues asking that very question. So perhaps we can learn from other art forms. The Royal Opera House and other organizations already offer this. They already offer attendance at their live events from cinemas around the country. And this has been, been going on before, before the pandemic. So maybe we should imagine the possibilities that a live stream performance offers, but maybe events could be tailored either online only or in person only. Here's an example from a comedy club in Manchester, Frog and Bucket. And they're working on this idea of how you optimize either an in-person stand-up comedy night or an online one. And they're not trying to do both. And maybe to try to do both is to miss the point of each. Um, and here's an example from the Young Vic. They now offer a best seat in the house program which director Kwame Kwe Armour states, is in response to this question of how they can make the experience as flexible and accessible as possible. And it allows you at home to choose your camera angle. So you can choose the camera angle that you view the theatre performance from. And what's really lovely to see as well is that there are theatre... There are theatres also experimenting with learning how audiences respond to what they're doing. So this is the Old Vic in Bristol, which is collaborating on research to look at biological measurements of theatre experiences. So what's really important is that we continue to undertake this research on how audiences find the experience of a live streamed attendance at an event and to make sure we make it as rich and enjoyable an experience as possible and avoid live streaming becoming what The Guardian called a dystopian nightmare of virtual audiences. What a beautiful headline. Um, perhaps we can learn from the world of sport uh, in how audience access events. Because not only have sporting events experimented with similar formats, for example, here's the National Basketball Association playing a game during COVID-19 with floating audience heads. Um, sports events have got a long history of being broadcast live to pubs and homes. Um, for example, football matches and other sports are regularly live streamed and they're regularly watched by groups of people, families, friends, communities, in pubs and homes together in real time. And sports promoters and venues have succeeded in creating this sense of occasion, sense of a shared experience, even when something is on a screen. Um, and Sky Sports don't even call their events live streams, they just call it TV, regular TV viewing. So for the final couple of minutes of the talk, I'm just going to show you a couple of the things I think are important in terms of future directions in this, in this research. Um, I think it's really important that this research continues to be funded. This is really, I think for me, this is not just about learning how we go and enjoy ourselves in the evening. I think learning about the live music experience is about learning what it means to be human and to communicate with each other and to form social bonds. So thank you to everyone who supports some of this research. And thank you to Barbara, who we have in the audience, who's, who's been very helpful in helping me to secure funding for my work. It's very important that we continue to support these amazing young researchers who are coming into this field. These are three researchers whose work I am in total awe of, who are just finishing their PhDs. They're really new in the field. And they're doing this incredible research that uses these different measures. And they're teaching us so much about the live experience. So shout out to this, this fantastic new generation of researchers that's coming through. And we must continue to support them. And finally, here are some studies that I'm planning at the moment with various lovely teams of collaborators. One of the studies that we are hoping to do in a couple of months is a study that looks at 
when you make music together, to what extent can you see evidence of neural coupling um, using EEG hyperscanning, which is a cool word that Microsoft Word doesn't like and always underlines. It's a new technique which means scanning two brains at once and looking at whether there's evidence that they are linking up and communicating. It's magic that you can see that. So we're looking at whether making music together gives evidence of neural coupling, which might give us some evidence that people are forming those social relationships. And give us lovely evidence about why we love this idea of you know, community choirs, workplace choirs, amateur orchestras. I'm also doing a lot of work, um, as Alex mentioned, on Parkinson's, and some of the projects we've been discussing as moving on to are around this idea of we know that music is used by people with Parkinson's, and we know that it can be useful for some specific, uh, for some specific things like instigating movement. Um, so we're now thinking about things like, okay, we know there are really useful dance workshops happening around the country. They often use recorded music. To what extent might live music um, enable something different in that space? And then finally, the other study that I'm working on at the moment with lovely collaborators Jason and Josie here is we've got this new portable EEG cap now at the RNCM, which means that we don't just have to conduct our research in the lab. We can take this lovely cap into a concert hall space and see what somebody's brain is doing in real time. So we've been testing that out. So I'm going to end by showing you a 12-second video, which is kind of my dream of where this research goes. But it's very experimental. It might not work. The, vid the video will work. Um, but the, exper the research is very new. But I think what, why this is so close to my heart is I think we can use what we know. We can use these methods. We can use our love for music, our need for music as humans. And we can create new knowledge that is really exciting and also really fun. So I've been experimenting with taking this cap, this EEG cap, into a concert hall space and projecting the output from that cap. So you can see the output from this neuroscience cap. And you can see different parts of the brain engaging at different times in real time. So they turn blue and red. And it looks lovely. So if you could project that onto a screen while a performance is happening and see someone's brain response in real time, it's actually a really nice multimodal experience. And I think with methods like this, not only can we address important agendas like bringing audiences into the research space, audiences co-researchers, we can also create something where we develop new methods and we have a way of creating new contemporary music performances. And I think really close to my heart is always that idea of collaboration, learning from each other, learning from audiences, learning from performers, learning from composers. Um, so I'll finish with this 12 second video which is a clip of the end of Ravel's Bolero played by the RNCM Arc Ensemble during one of their rehearsals. So it's a very short clip but what you'll see is you'll see the screen above them with somebody uh, who's wearing the EG cap with their brain response projected and then the camera will pan down and you'll see them with the cap on watching the performance. So this is my dream, let's do more research like this, let's make it fun in a concert hall space. I'll show you the video and I'll end there. Michelle, that was fantastic. Um, so we have lots of time for, for input from the audience, um, both in the room and online. Um, if you're in the room, please wait for a microphone so that everybody at home or wherever they happen to be can hear you. Um, and we'll start with questions and comments from people who are here and then allow our online people some time to type. Um, so I'm going to throw it open to the floor, but I'm actually going to start with a question of my own um, as chair's privilege, um, which is, Michelle, you've, you've talked a lot about um, the features of the live experience, and I wondered about the quality point of view that you mentioned, because if you're pushing things on to people at home, it's very much dependent on what they've got to access. Yeah. And I wondered if that had emerged anywhere in your your first study where you're asking people about their impressions about mm. you know if you're in a live situation the quality of the sound experience is kind of taken care of yeah yeah but if you're at home it depends on how good your television or your speakers or your headphones or whatever happens so it's kind of putting the the chain of production into a different place yeah 
It's, it's, a, it's a great question, great question. And of course, that also feeds into things like the accessibility agenda, because yes, people might be saving money traveling to a venue, but if they can only afford to listen to it on their tiny phone, is that really a good experience? Yeah, absolutely. And actually, it's a really pertinent question, because I do, we do have that data. We did ask people in that first survey how they listen and what sort of kit they have, and I haven't analyzed all of that yet, so I'm really looking forward to looking at it. But you're absolutely right. This is partly why you know, I feel very lucky, and I love working with the team at the university of Salford with the acoustics team there, Trevor, Bruno and Duncan, because that's what they're doing. You know, they're leading research in home listening equipment and, and other areas. And I think you're right. A lot of the comments we got back on that survey were in relation to sound quality. And they were, you know, they were, they, there were advantages and disadvantages from people saying, actually, I like listening at home because I get a good camera angle. I can see the band player's face. Whereas if I'm in an, an, in, a, in an arena, I'm right at the back, I can't see that. So sometimes live streaming is better. But then we got people saying, well, if you're listening at home, you can't feel the vibrations in the room, on the floor, the sound quality experience is terrible. So I think you're right. It's a very different experience for lots of different people. And until we learn more about that, it's difficult to generalize. Hmm. So another, I suppose another related point then is, it's a bit of a shame for people in the audience who might be interested in the video production side to hear that actually the, those professionally produced versions yeah, yeah. were not as good as a live performance at all. Yeah. And actually some of those things that you say, you know, in a live setting you might not be able to see. Yeah. But if you've got all the angles, actually it's still not, it's still not better. That's yeah. not the only thing, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that, I think a few ensembles experimented with that over COVID. The idea that you don't simply put a camera at the back of the room and live stream something, that you take some time and some care to film something that has multiple camera angles and is in a nice space and is a different medium. And yeah, I don't think there's a lot of research on this yet, but so far it does seem that there's still a quality of liveness that isn't replicated by that format. But you, I think those kinds of initiatives, they're learning from pop music videos, which are very popular, that idea of a highly produced pop video as an art form in its own right. So. I don't know where that will go. It'd be interesting to see what decisions bands and ensembles make on that. Mm, thanks very much. We've got a question. Yeah. Thank you for a fascinating talk. Um, I, I was hoping to ask a little bit about, um, if I was seeing the data correctly, I may, I may not, between like R and HQR, it seemed like those figures were very similar. And I wondered if there yeah. are implications there for whether there's a market for almost you know rapid renting, perhaps, rather than live streaming of the event that's there. And then I wondered uh, if I could sneak a sort of second sub question in that. Um, There's sort of lessons from the sport parallels. I wondered about you know, having the audience there and that sort of sense of being the fly on the wall rather than just being in the rehearsal, yeah. where it seemed quite unsettling, I think, to many people to have like, empty stadiums uh, and you know, trying to pipe in crowd noise during you know, 2020. Yeah, it's a really good point. Yeah, so on the first question, you're absolutely right. There aren't many differences there between the two screen versions of our experiment. One that was the static camera filming that exact performance and one that was the, the, the music video. Um, I think there are some, some differences in the neurological data. There's not many, there are some. You can see on the, on the right here, the differences there are marked, the statistically significant differences are with, with the green stars. Um, but there are various reasons for that. I think an important, Part of sharing this research is sharing the extent to which it can be unreliable. You know, there are limitations to this experiment that we need to think about addressing. It might be the case simply that what we are seeing here is a difference between people feeling like they're in a room with other people and people watching a screen and that that has caused the differences. It doesn't matter what they were watching on the screen, they were watching a screen. And it might be that we need more participants. You know, we had 20 participants in this experiment, which is not many. We've, we were trialing a methodology, really. So perhaps when we get more participants, we might see a difference. There are many things that might have caused noise in this data that make it unreliable. Another one is that perhaps simply the, the, the extent to which the volume varied in the room was different with the live ensemble and the, and the, and the reverb from the wall compared to watching on the screen. So there are many reasons why this data might be unreliable. And so there might be no differences between those two screen conditions, or there might be, and we just didn't have the experimental paradigm to get at it. Um, it's a good point. And your second question was about, um, yeah, people listening at home and venues being empty. Yeah, I, I mean, I think... 
I do think we're going to see more drive towards better ways to experience something without traveling, purely because of climate change agendas. And you see bands like Coldplay driving this from the front, saying, you know, we're not going to tour because of climate change concerns. So we are going to see more of this, and I think venues are going to have to catch up with this and find ways to project to other venues or to people's homes in a much more sophisticated and attractive way. But I do think that idea of, you know, for football, you get people making a real event of it on an afternoon, come around to our house, you know, we'll have some food, we'll, we'll have some snacks, we'll wear the t-shirts and the scarves, you know, let's do that for the proms, let's do that for festivals. Fantastic, thank you. Great, thanks. Um, Tim, next, then we've got some more comments. Thank you very much, Alex. So I've got a, uh, thank you, Michelle, wonderful talk. I've got a great question from our online audience. So Jennifer, shall I just read out here? Uh, thank you for an interesting talk. I'm one of those disabled families uh, who appreciate live streams. You mentioned animals. We have a flock of chickens who sing what we call the chicken chorus in order to contribute to social cohesion. I wonder if it isn't so much the species as whether they are a social species. Oh, what a qu well, luckily I'm an expert on chicken. No, I'm not. Um, <laughs> What a great question. I, I mean, it's a brilliant question for so many reasons, but I think what that hits on as well is that we are just starting to learn about animals and sounds. And there's a lot of fantastic work being done over the last 20 to 30 years in music psychology on whether animals make sounds that are meaningful or that are, there's a lot of work on whether animals can latch onto a beat, for example. So there's a lot of work on Snowball, the cockatoo. We've had work on sea lions. And um, we've recently had work on a, a, a rats and whether they can latch onto a beat. There's a team in Asia that are looking at rats. Um, so this idea of the role of sound in animal species, I think, is really interesting. And again, it's something we don't know a lot about, but what a beautiful example. I'd love to know if they join in with the chickens and it becomes a family affair. <laughs> Lovely, thanks. We've got two people at the back who had their hands up. Um, there's the lady right at the back. Could have... Yep, thank you. Shall I just shut no, no. <laughs> Sorry, I'm quite capable of shouting. Um, there's a, a recent work done with parakeets who chose to use tablets to interchange with each other. Wow! And I just wondered, that says an awful lot, because parakeets apparently, um, or at least some species of parrots, do actually give their children names, call names, that they, that they use to, to, put, to um, attract the attention. And you know, it seems to me that we're missing out a whole lot of information on other species. Sorry. Yeah. No, I think you're right. Wow, I don't know about that. That's fascinating. I'm gonna, I'm gonna look that up. That's absolutely fascinating. And I think as well, that idea that there are various communication mechanisms that species use. And for humans, I think we assume that our main one is language, which of course it probably is. But I think that can limit us from thinking about other things as communication means, including various different art forms. And I think sometimes people can fall foul of thinking of the idea of music as a pure entertainment system. You know, it's for leasure, it's for having a nice time, um, it's for going out in the evening. Um, Whereas it is much more than that. And, and, and I think we can learn some of that from animal species, the ways that sounds are used to form social bonds. And that is partly what music does for us. Thank you. We've got another question here. Then we're going to come to this group of people at the front. <laughs> we've all Thanks, really. Hands up. <laughs> I very much enjoyed your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you mentioned the uh, work which is being done with people uh, suffering from Parkinson's mm. disease. Uh, have you done very much with people suffering from dementia, perhaps. Um, the reason I ask that is uh, because it's becoming fairly obvious. I think there's a radio station at the moment that, that more or less continuously plays music for people uh, with dementia. Yeah. Often um, it's, it's simply um, nostalgia, uh, yeah. which is fine. But um, I have done... I said a little work. It's, it's just on a personal basis. With it, I, at the church I, I attend, uh, we have um, uh, one particular lady who suffers uh, from dementia. Um, I've sat with her and we've listened to music. She loves music. She played the piano. She was at school. She taught music. So I sat with her she, and we play music. She loves music. She goes to sleep sooner or later. I did one, on one occasion take her to a live performance of a string quartet. Oh, she wow. didn't fall asleep. Not only did she not fall asleep because she, because she felt the interaction, I was told afterwards that several of the members of the quartet were aware of her 
in the room. They couldn't put a, put a particular reason like why they were aware of her, but they, they, they were. So the, the potential uh, of live music for Alzheimer's sufferers, I think, is, is, uh, is quite significant. It's huge. It's, hu it's huge. It's a yeah, really nice question. And the music in dementia research that has been done is absolutely incredible. I, I'm, not, I'm not doing that research. I'm in awe of people who are doing it, because what we're learning is amazing. Actually, Manchester Camerata are doing some fantastic work on that. They've got a, uh, a cafe where they invite people to come along who have dementia. Um, what the, the research is showing as well and has shown for a good 20 or 30 years around that is that some of the capacities that are lost when people are suffering with Alzheimer's, um, like language and like memory of names and places and dates, um, are lost before music. So people can often still sing a childhood song um, or can still recognise something on the radio. And there's been some lovely work done that suggests that the capacity for music seems to be one of the later things that goes. And also that it can tap into things that can't be unlocked in other ways. And I think it, you know, it's such important research that we, that we learn more about this because of the prevalence of Alzheimer's and how much more common it's becoming. And again, music seems to enable people to access something that other communication mechanisms can't. So I totally agree with you. It's another one of those pieces of evidence as to why music is not just a nice to have in human life. You know, it's something that actually we need. It's a communication tool that we need. Absolutely great. So, have your question. Um, quick comment on the um, the quality question. I think your your kind of sample is quite an unusual sample. When you look on the train, I think there's huge swathes of people who don't care about quality because yeah, they yeah. just use a tiny weeny little speaker in their ear or use their laptop speakers or whatever. Um, the, my question though is how this works with regards to what people can see and I think one of the things about the live experience is the, something about seeing the action on stage, the mm. pulling of a string, the pressing of a key or whatever and how that comes to you in real time. And I wonder whether there's something that you could do where maybe you blindfold people oh, and see yeah. how it would be different if they can't see the person playing at the same time. That's a great idea, yeah. And, and maybe even play them, tell them that they're either listening to live or recorded. If you could get the volume and the reverb conditions right and see what, what, inf what difference that makes on their perception of what they're listening to. It's a really good question. And I think there is more to learn. I think you're right, because that physical presence came back quite strongly in that data. But what does that actually mean? And you're absolutely right. You know, all of this, these experiments and a lot of what's been done is done on a sample. So you can't say that everybody in the world experiences music in this way. You know, far from it. It's a sample. And it's a very Western-centric sample. You know, there's been a lot of research done on Western populations. We actually don't know a lot about humans in general, because people haven't looked at communities around the world. So I think you're right, this is a limited picture and there's lots more we need to learn. And it would be fascinating to run a study like that, yeah. Yeah, let's do that. <laughs> uh, thank you for this fascinating talk. I have a question and a half. Ooh. So the first one is, uh, do you have any concerns that a young generations, young children, young adults appreciate music um, in an anti-social or a non-social environment. Would, that, would they understand the music differently? That's my question. The second yeah. bit is about the uh, brain waves capturing research. Yeah. Um, uh, have you had a chance or uh, you, you intend to have a collaboration with uh, Eduardo Miranda, the professor mm -hmm. from uh, the Plymouth University, uh, because he's done quite a lot of uh, kind of uh, data capturing, uh, highlighting the diff uh, their reaction in different centers of the brain yeah. on particular uh, music. So I was just cu curious to hear. Yeah, he's, and it is great work, you're right. I'm relatively new to neurological research. I'm still learning, and there's some great work out there. Yeah, so on your first question, it's interesting, isn't it? We were talking about this earlier today, about the way in which different generations engage with music differently and how sometimes it can be surprising. I still find it surprising how my six and eight year old engage with music in different ways. You know, they have YouTube on one screen and Roblox on the other and FaceTime on the other. Um, and it's very different and it can feel quite jarring. I see people listening to music on the bus and I think, well, that, that can't sound very nice through those little headphones. Um, I, I think one of my impressions from that idea of um, whether people are listening more on their own than socially, 
is I think that we are starting to be more aware of different individual, dif different individual differences, does that work? Um, of, of how people are different. We are much more aware, I think, aren't we, as, as, as a society of people with different neurodiversities, for example. And I do think, and I fear, that data like this perhaps show us that there've been some people in our societies who've, who haven't been able to access live music because they have social phobias or they have, or they can't, I spoke to one person who works with people living with dementia and she said, well, the venues near me don't have toilets that are near enough to the seats. So I can't, I can't attend live music. So I think maybe it's, it could be the other way around that we're starting to be more aware now of the fact that attending a live music event is sometimes not desirable or not possible for people because of their various individual differences. So maybe the opportunity to listen to something isolated while you're on the bus, maybe you don't get any other free time, is quite a nice one. Um, I don't know though, it's a good question. Um, and the work that's been done on music and EEG, there's a lot of great work on music and EEG. And EEG is a lovely way to study music because it is so fast. It can show us our responses in real time down to the level of the millisecond. Um, so yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot to be learned from other studies of, of EEG. Um, Jason Taylor, who I do a lot of work with, who's, who's fantastic, sent me a paper this morning that a Finnish team have done where they've taken, we were talking about this earlier, They've used EEG to look at people's responses to a, a piece, a performance of Bach played in the standard way versus a piece of Bach that includes improvisation. And what they found is that there's more theta activity in the brains of people listening to the performance that includes improvisation, which suggests that they experience something quite different or more creative or more novel. So again, that kind of research is brilliant. There's so much more we can do and so much we can learn from other teams around the world. Thank you. So there's another, another question from our online audience, and this one's from William, um, very appropriate in a university context, I guess. Does your research support the anecdotal evidence that live face-to-face -face university lectures yeah. are more engaging than recorded asynchronous <laughs> lectures? Oh, this is dangerous territory, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> dangerous. I mean, I think the COVID-19 pandemic has been horrific, hasn't it? But it's given us such an opportunity to learn. And I think we as a sector, if I can, if I can generalise, maybe that's unfair. As a university sector, the aftermath that we're seeing in terms of changes in student behaviours and the ways that we do things is, is often quite difficult. You know, we are finding different ways that students would like to engage uh, or need to engage. I think, I, I don't think you can generalise any of my data to student lectures. I, I don't, I, I haven't done any research on that. However, I do think some of the things we can learn are linked, such as, you know, perhaps when we were only able to offer a stand-up lecture as part of our modules, perhaps there will, would have been some students who would only have been able to come along to half of that because they're living with a condition that means they can't always come along. And what COVID has given us, and if institutions are able to offer hybrid or recorded, those people don't have to miss out anymore. So I think much as some of uh, our institutions are finding it difficult, this new post-COVID world in terms of how we engage with students, I hope there's a lot to learn that is going to be to the benefit of the graduates of the future because we can support them better. Hi. Um, a lovely talk. Thank you very much. Um, my question was just related to the sort of whole thing about the concept of live music, that it's been assumed that a live music event is something that could be replicated also online and that's the case with a sort of major concert jazz classical whatever but there are a lot of sort of grassroots community music activities that go on that involve people that you know form communities that um, create friendships and groups and social sort of activity yeah. and these are things that have suffered a lot through covid because they haven't a been able to be replicated in the same way during a pandemic um, and they are live events where it would just be small groups of people meeting together, playing music, joining in, cementing friendships in a more sort of um, informal way. Um, I just wondered what you thought about that in relation to everything. 
Yeah, I wholeheartedly agree. I think there's some fantastic research going on, and, and a lot of it is being led by Ian Cross, who was our, our PhD supervisor, amazing man, and doing amazing research on this idea that fundamentally music is participatory. That's its origins. You know, and a lot of cultures around the world don't have the prevalence of streamed music that we have. Music is participatory. It's what you do together at a festival or an event or a grievance. Um, and actually, some would argue that we've come, we've come away from that with commodification of music. We've turned it into something that could be bought and sold. Um, and, that's, and that's taken it away from its roots, which is that it's participatory. But there's still so much evidence of this. The examples you've given, folk sessions, karaoke, you know, people who get together in church and sing hymns. Music is still a participatory act in our communities. And you're right, that we didn't have any of that. And I do think, quite often as well, thinking about live music, that idea of interaction is participation. People want to go along and they want to be able to sway or to clap. You know, you see it in the proms, don't you, as well? People want to be able to move together or clap together. And that's participating, sharing the experience. So you're right, a lot of this data and a lot of the research that, that I've done and that others have done brings us back to the idea that fundamentally music is a participator experience in its essence, and we, and we seek that. Thank you, this has been very interesting. Um, I've got a, an aspect of it that you might not have had an opportunity to consider. Um, I've worked with a person who became profoundly deaf and has learned to pick up pitch and sing the pitch accurately. She can't hear anything now from vibrations. And much to my surprise, she said she wanted to come to a concert. And I thought, well, what's she going to get out of this concert? And she went to a live performance of Elijah. Ah. And she was blown away by it. I, I mean, I can't imagine what she feels from that or quite how she understands it, but when you talk about the participatory aspect, the extra thing that has been important to her, and you might like to, if you had the opportunity, to try with people who are profoundly deaf or mm. very, very deaf, if not profoundly, um, that the thing that you said about the importance of being part of something, perhaps singing in church, and for her that was the most important thing and the thing she dreaded was to be able to go was to go to a service and find they all sing songs she doesn't know <sighs> so her, her her reason for having to take part in this research was could she ever learn new songs which she did wow and as long as she's with some other people singing she can stay in tune but not if she's on her own she drifts but the the participatory part is absolutely fascinating and important for her life that's amazing. It was really interesting. I, I think, again, it, we're, it, we're in a time where we're becoming much more aware of how to make things open up to more people. And I think this even comes back to our own concert hall and gig traditions. You know, that whole idea that if you go and see certain sorts of performances, you can't get up and go to the toilet, um, or you can't open a suite, or you can't calm someone down if they're a bit stressed or they're a bit emotional. That whole idea that it's frowned upon, that we have this tradition that we seek to protect. You know, there's lots of nice things about that, but there's lots of ways in which we should question that because maybe it means that people can't attend who would like to attend. Um, and I, I haven't worked with profoundly deaf um, audience members or musicians. I, I'd love to. I know colleagues who've done some great work. Jane Ginsburg, a colleague of mine, has done some great work. Um, but I, I can't remember where this was, but there is a venue that is experimenting with um, a, a floor that transmits the vibrations of the music up through the floor. Does, has anyone come across this? That I can't remember where it is, but there's a venue that's experimenting with, for people who are profoundly deaf, transmitting the vibrations through their feet. And there's also a company, again, I can't remember who this is, but there's a company that's experimenting with suits that you can wear that transmit the vibrations through your body and also light up in response to the vibrations so that you can see the vibrations even if you can't hear them. And I think that kind of work needs a lot, needs more support. You know, it's absolutely fantastic that there have been people who've been marginalised from attending and participating in music and we are now more aware of that and we need to get better at, at, at supporting it and facilitating it. Great. Tim, have we got any more online? No? No? Anybody else in the room? Anyone got any more? Yes, one at the back. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for a very interesting talk. Um, just coming back to one or two people talking about the participation side of things. I, it did cross, I mean, I, I totally agree with if we've got the technology, we should be using it and exploiting it. But if it did take off, if we were to project it, say, 10 years in the future, if live streaming was to overtake 
the audience, A, would the venue bother putting the show on in the first place? Yeah. And B, how would the band or the artist feel because he's playing to a half empty room, yeah, yeah. potentially? So. Yeah, it, it's a good question. And, and for me, I think we need to make advances in bandwidth before we can solve some of this. But there are some really nice examples of, again, some of this has been driven by bands like Coldplay. I think what would be a really exciting point to get to is the idea that a band can perform at a venue, but that that can be transmitted to other venues in real time in a really uh, effective way so that venues are able to support streaming in other performances from other venues and so the venue itself can create that feeling of a sense of occasion a, a venue a buzz a sense of immersion with high quality vi videos and sound and you know we've got these fantastic things like the abba the, the, the ABBA venue in London where, you know, you're watching avatars and yeah, I know a couple of people who've been along to that. I don't know if there's been any research conducted with that, with that venue who say it feels very real, feels very much like a live performance and yet you are actually seeing avatars. So I think you're right. There's a lot we could lose, but hopefully with technological advance, there's a lot we can gain as well. Um, but it, hopefully it's going to be an exciting time to see what happens. Hi. Uh, oh, hi. Um, I hi. just wanted to ask, um, in the data, if there was any correlation between, let's say, people who came to see the performance because they are interested in the experience of just enjoying live music versus people who were, let's say, interested in the musician or the artist, and if there was any kind of similarities closer um, with people who, let's say, watched the live stream version, but they watched it because they were really into the musician versus yeah. someone who watched the um, the live version but just wasn't as interested but preferred the experience a bit more. Yeah, you've hit on a really interesting question, and the answer is I don't know, because I, I did, we didn't get data at that fine level of granularity, but I wish we had. It's a really good idea and a really good point. So the people who answered the survey, I haven't shown you all the data, but... Um, I asked them to define what, what genre they would consider their favourite genre to be, which is always difficult when you ask about people's preferred music genre because I'm not a big fan of putting music in boxes. You know, I think music's music and, and we shouldn't try to force it into a category. So I gave people an open text box and that in itself was quite interesting. Quite a few people wrote music festivals as a genre, which I think is really interesting. Um, most people who filled in that survey said that their favourite music was a, a version of rock or pop. So there are many rock or pop concert goers. So again, that data is limited in terms of what we can learn from it for classical music concerts, for example, or jazz or folk. Um, but one of the things we, that you can't tell from that data that I think would be a lovely next study, I don't know if you're a, um, a researcher yourself, but you could run a study like this, this would be fascinating. Another study that'd be really interesting to run would be to look at how people would answer the questions in that survey dependent on different contexts. Because what that survey gives you is an impression of a very kind of large-scale overview of people's experiences. But what it doesn't account for is that, well, one person, in January, one person might want to go to a classical concert in person, and then in February, they might have some caring responsibilities that mean they want to attend a folk concert online, and then in March, they might want to go to a gig with their family and friends, and then, you know, every one person might have different preferences at any one time in their month, in their day, in their life. So you can't tell from that data that individual granularity about the different choices somebody might make given different contexts. So we need more data. Be great, be great to find out some answers to those questions. Right. Is there time for just one more? Yep. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so, uh, another question from the online audience, Michelle, this is Martin. Has there been research on how performers act differently when playing to just a live audience, just a streamed audience, and a hybrid audience? Uh, I, I haven't done any research on that. I wish I had. What a, what a great idea. In fact, there isn't enough research on, on music performers. I've, I've done a lot of research on music and time. And we were talking about earlier how there isn't a lot of research on time perception from the point of view of the performer. There's quite a, a lot on the perception uh, of the audience member. So that's a really good point, whether the performers themselves in a live performance are perhaps more expressive. Maybe they react to the audience more compared to if they're just playing to a camera. Maybe they move less. That would be fascinating to do. And it's something you can do with these, with these wristbands because they measure 
acceleration. So you could see the extent to which a violinist's bow arm might move in those two different scenarios. It'd be really interesting. I mean, what I imagine, um, and what it'd be lovely to look into, is that that sense of interaction in a musical experience goes both ways. You know, it's a participatory thing that a, a, a group of performers or a performer would also say, I want to feel a sense of interaction as well. I think we probably all have had scenarios where we, we much prefer it if people are seem to be participating rather than passively um, joining in. So, yeah, another great study to do. Let's do loads of research studies together. These are great ideas. <laughs> That's a great place to finish. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you ever so much, Michelle. It was an absolutely thank fascinating you. coverage of so many different topics and, and also um, great response to questions as well. So thank you thank so much you. for coming. <laughs>